Good morning, I'm Shante Hinton, an associate chair in the Department of Biology at the College of William & Mary. As I think about the social injustice and the undeniable racial injustice blatantly displayed in our nation today, I am grateful that I am able to remain hopeful. I am hopeful because many entities and institutions within our beloved scientific arena are acknowledging and owning their parts in inequities. The inequities we are addressing include racial injustices that arise through direct racism or discrimination or implicit biases. More importantly, there's an understanding that we too, as scientists, must be actively engaged and be intentional. We need to change our historical narrative of the good old boys club. It is, it is, working, with, it is working together with our different perspectives and narratives that make us champions, as happened in the worldwide efforts to develop the COVID 19 vaccine over the past year. My colleague, mentor, and dear friend, Dr. Elizabeth A. Allison, understands the importance of humanity, of all people, and believes in the best of humanity. She champions the best of people and demands that we present our better selves because this is who she is. She paved the way for me as a first generation college student to become the first minority scientist ever hired at the College of William and Mary. She understood and understands the importance of role models, but more importantly, of having a team of diverse minds and leaders. She works actively not only to create a diverse and inclusive environment, but a more innovative and engaging environment that we can welcome and excite all students in STEM, including underrepresented minorities. While serving as department chair, her leadership and mentorship increased the number of women who became full professors and the number of underrepresented faculty in her department. Dr. Allison's tenure as chair also coincided with a doubling in the number of underrepresented minority students graduating from biology and continued to rise in later years. Many of these students became excellent researchers who matriculated to doctoral programs. Her willingness to use her talents to mentor early career faculty and students of underrepresented groups intentionally and unapologetically is the epitome of the Ruth Kirstein Diversity and Science Award. There's no doubting when working with Liz that you are Liz's colleague, not a project, not beneath her, but equal and valued. She routinely involves underrepresented scientists from HBCUs as participants in her federally funded research pro program investigating the thyroid hormone receptors role in nuclear trafficking. She respects, expects, and knows that underrepresented minority scientists are excellent researchers, as are our Caucasian, Asian, and all other colleagues. This is how science encompasses and changes its landscape for diversity and retention in the sciences. Thus, it is an honor to introduce Dr. Elizabeth A. Allison as the ASBMB 2020 Ruth Kirstein Diversity and Science Awardee. It is such a great honor um, to be here today. And, you know, a year ago when I found out that I had won this award, I was incredibly humbled and surprised. And when I was thinking about the talk I was going to present, it was definitely going to be more focused on thyroid hormone receptor intracellular trafficking, along with some of my journey and the people involved. But now I feel like I should retitle the talk as Reflections on the 2020 Worth Ruth Kirsting Diversity and Science Award, because the past year has been one that has been filled with so much grief and anxiety and chaos. And I think all of us have had a lot of time to reflect on our, our lives along with our science. And so this talk is now going to be a bit more focused on the people and less so on um, scientific data. So I've had a year to reflect. And again, I'm incredibly honored and humbled by this award. And, and my first response to receiving the award was thinking, I don't deserve to be here. And after a few months of reflection about that, I was like, well, you know, I should trust the judgment of those who invited me. And if you're following along the sequence, you, you know that sort of the next panel would be, I'm here because I earned it. Well, that one, yeah, it might take me another 10 years to get to that point. But in my reflections, what I was really thinking about was that I feel like 
such a, a, a tiny little ripple in a small pond. Um, but then I started realizing that those tiny ripples have set in motion forces of great consequence. So if I'm a tiny ripple in a small pond, then my colleague, Dr. Shante Hinton, is a surging wave. Um, Shante is now an associate professor of biology at William and Mary, and is the first faculty member of color in the sciences um, at William and Mary. And, and close behind her surging forth is Cyril Anatiano, who was in my lab as a master's student and is now a PhD student at the University of North Carolina. These are the forces to watch. And these are the colleagues and students whose scientific careers I've been able to encourage and cultivate. So what are the characteristics of a successful scientist? You could all make a list. And in that list, you might say intelligent, courageous, persistent, full of initiative. But notably absent from that list is anything to do with socially constructed identities like race, ethnicity, religious affiliation, gender identity, the, the list goes on and on. So if you don't listen past this point in the talk, you'll really get the take home message. And that is that there's no scientific evidence that suggests that scientific potential and talent differentially segregate across these socially constructed identities. But what I'm saying really is that we all take great joy and, and share in the thrill of making novel discoveries together. And I like to tell my students that when it comes to identities, that really I'm mixed species is how I identify. So I'm 3.1% Neanderthal and 3.8% Denisovan and, you know, and proud of it. So the, the issue is that, you know, if we're not, if we're not part of the majority, then getting there, being successful in science can be really a daily obstacle course and very fraught with inequity and microaggression. And there's sexism, there's systemic racism, there's discrimination of all kinds. And the bottom line is that we need to persist. And what I'm hoping is that in some of the things that I say today, that maybe I can encourage some of the young investigators living, um, listening to this presentation to persist in their pursuit of a career in science. So how did I get started? Well, I was born in Bellingham, Washington. And the same year that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it's the presence of justice. So my parents, through their actions, raised me to understand about kindness and justice and dignity and respect, but they also passed on a lot of low self-esteem and probably humility to, to a fault. So my father was a high school chemistry teacher. My mother was a homemaker. And my father really had the belief that girls should be educated, but mainly to be good mothers and wives in the future. So sort of not surprisingly, my first memorable gift when I was six years old was not a chemistry set. It was a nice little kitchen set, which had fun plastic waffles and a toaster and some maple syrup. And I do still really enjoy baking and cooking and showing my appreciation for people um, through what I make for them. But I was um, the first girl in my family to go to college and being a true pioneer, I decided to go off to the last frontier, the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, where I got my bachelor's and a master's degree. My mentors there were males. Um, that was really, at the time, most scientists were male. Um, and I was encouraged by them. They saw potential in me that I didn't even know that I had. They encouraged me to stay in academics. So I went off to University of Washington to do my PhD. And then never being one to really follow the path that maybe I should have, I decided to bypass the postdoc stage and I moved off to New Zealand um, where I took a faculty position at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch and was eventually promoted to the equivalent of associate professor there um, as a senior lecturer. Um, after about eight years, um, I decided to move back to the States and I ended up at William & Mary 
where I've moved through the ranks and am now um, a full professor. In all of those travels um, around the world, um, the thing that has been so important to me is having a lab of my own. And that's because in my lab, I belong in science. And I can create a space that's welcoming and inclusive, a space that I can maintain where um, each student or colleague has access to the resources they need um, to succeed. So over the years, there have been so many students um, and colleagues involved in my research, and I don't have time to talk about all their work or name them all by name, but I do want to, at this point in the talk, um, acknowledge um, the many past and present members of the Allison Lab. They're an incredibly talented array of, of scientists from many different backgrounds and social identities, probably greater than 150 undergraduates, master's students, PhD students, my lab manager of 20 years. And we've been funded, fortunately, by NSF and NIH um, throughout the years. So the work that I've done, I suppose, again, not surprising since I obviously love to travel, is that I've really explored travels in the cellular world and particularly looking at the um, pathways for proteins to get into the nucleus. And we're interested in this because of the understanding the localization signals and mechanisms and their role in gene expression and the control of cell growth um, and differentiation. And also then thinking in terms of this being traffic control, um, what goes wrong um, in certain disease states with this localization. So the model system in which we work is the thyroid system. So the thyroid gland produces thyroid hormones, and this is triggered by signals from the hypothalamus and the pituitary, but we're really focused at the cellular level and how is this hormonal signal received by cells. So we focus on the thyroid hormone receptor, which is a ligand dependent transcription factor, and the thyroid hormone receptor interacts usually with the retinoid X receptor, another nuclear receptor. It binds to thyroid hormone response elements in the DNA and represses gene transcription. And then in the presence of thyroid hormone, um, it activates those same genes. So our interest has been in understanding how localization mechanisms are impacted by mutations in the thyroid hormone receptor, um, some of which are associated with types of cancer, and with resistance to thyroid hormone syndrome. So back years ago, when I first started working on thyroid hormone receptor localization, it was really with an interest in how does the receptor get into the nucleus? So the dogma at the time was that thyroid hormone receptor being a nuclear receptor and a transcription factor would reside solely in the nucleus tightly bound to DNA. And that thyroid hormone would come from outside the cell and then interact with the receptor in the nucleus. And so we just wanted to find out how the receptor after synthesis in the cytoplasm would get into the nucleus. And so we've done much of our work in cells growing in culture. We grow them in six well plates on cover slips um, and introduce expression vectors for fluorescently tagged thyroid hormone receptor or other proteins um, into the cell. Once these are expressed, we have the fluorescent tag thyroid hormone receptor, and we can follow its passage back into the nucleus. And what we found when we looked under the fluorescent microscope, you can see the outlines of the cells here by light microscopy, and then the bright green nucleus indicating that thyroid hormone receptor at steady state is primarily localized in the nucleus. But what we found was that in fact, it's rapidly shuttling between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And if you look at fluorescence recovery after photobleaching, after bleaching one nucleus in a shared cytoplasm that happens to have two nuclei in it, what you can see is that after bleaching, you get gradual recovery, maybe over about an hour of fluorescence, indicating that some of the thyroid hormone receptor in this nucleus has moved into the shared cytoplasm and then been imported into that other nucleus. You can see it accumulating there. So what that told us is that there's an additional checkpoint in the control of thyroid hormone responsive gene expression that's involved in controlling this nucleocytoplasmic shuttling. So the question really became not only how does TR thyroid hormone receptor enter the nucleus, but how does it exit the nucleus? So we embarked, and that 
the we means um, many undergraduates and graduate students on a very systematic study of where the localization signals might be in thyroid hormone receptor and two subtypes of it, alpha-1 and beta-1. So there are two nuclear localization signals in alpha-1 and only one in TR beta-1. And you can see the domain structure. There's an AB um, domain at the end terminus with NLS2 um, and then DNA binding domain, a hinge domain with nuclear localization signal one, and then the ligand binding domain where thyroid hormone interacts. We also did a very systematic um, study of nuclear export signals, and we found that there are multiple nuclear export signals. And in fact, what are shown here are some of the signals that we know of in the ligand binding domain that we've characterized by their amino acid sequences. But there are some additional ones that we're not quite sure where they are yet. So after characterizing these signals within the thyroid hormone receptor, we went on to do a series of studies to determine which um, exportance and importance transport factors were required to either import or export thyroid hormone receptor from the nucleus. So what we found was that thyroid hormone receptor in the cytoplasm can interact with important alpha, important beta, or important seven. And then it's taken through a very beautiful and complicated protein structure called the nuclear pore complex or NPC through the nuclear envelope that surrounds the nucleus. And once in the nucleus, then thyroid hormone receptor can be released to bind to DNA. Um, and going out, it interacts with a cal reticulum CREM1 complex with exportin 7, um, exportin 5, and 4. So there's a lot of movement going on back and forth. And what we really wanted to then begin to understand is what factors play a role in nuclear retention of TR alpha. So what keeps it in the nucleus where it functions? So this gets back to work done by Cyril um, as an honors undergraduate in the lab and also as a master's student. And Cyril became interested in assimilation, so post-translational modification of lysines within the thyroid hormone receptor. And this is a dynamic modulation. It can be um, acetylation occurs by cats or lysine acetyltransferases, and then deacetylation can occur by, can call them either HDACs for histone deacetylases or KDACs for lysine deacetylases. And what was interesting to him was that within NLS, NLS1, the nuclear localization signal, um, there are three lysines that were known from other labs work to be sites of acetylation. And so what Cyril did um, in a very beautiful study, and I'm only gonna just highlight a couple of points from that study, was to show that mutants that mimic acetylation, so changing that lysine to a glutamine, so K to Q substitutions, showed a significant decrease in nuclear localization relative to wild type or relative to a substitution that mimics non-acetylation, so lysine to arginine or K to R. So over on the y-axis is the N over C ratio, which is just a measure of the fluorescence in the nucleus compared to the cytoplasm. So normal wild type, type GFP tagged TR beta one compared to a non-acetylation mimic, there's no significant difference. But when you look at the localization patterns of the acetylation mimic, you can see that it's much more cytosolic, so a much lower N over C ratio. Sarah also found similar results for TR-alpha-1, um, but it was compensated partially by this additional nuclear localization signal that alpha-1 has. So Sarah also went on to look at fluorescence recovery after photobleaching within the nucleus to determine how dynamic um, these acetylation or non-acetylation mimics are within the nucleus. And so what he found was that the acetylation mimic has the same rate of recovery as wild type TR. So if you bleach a strip across the nucleus with a laser, you can see the bleach, and then it recovers very rapidly um, within less than a second. But if you look at the non-acetylation mimic, it has a much slower rate of recovery well, relative to both wild type and also the acetylation mimic. 
So if we watch over the same time period, you can see the bleach. And then within the same time frame, there's very little recovery. So the next question really is what's regulating this acetylation and deacetylation since it has such an impact on localization of the thyroid hormone receptor. So really what we've, we've come to in our understanding is that there's a very fine balance between nuclear import, nuclear export, and nuclear retention of the thyroid hormone receptor. And that imbalance may lead to mislocalization of the receptor. And this may then contribute to some of the pathology of different types of cancer and resistance to thyroid hormone syndrome, work that I really haven't talked about. Um, but we see um, mislocalization um, when there are even just single point mutations in the receptor, it can become much more cytoplasmic in its distribution. You can see the nucleus as a black hole here. You can see aggregates and foci within the cytoplasm or even aggregates within the nucleus. And so we're exploring some of the impact and contribution of this type of mislocalization on different types of disease. So if we get back to a model of how thyroid hormone receptors get there, meaning to the nucleus, you can see that this diagram is um, much more complicated than what I started out with at the beginning of the talk. So we have a pathway of import of thyroid hormone receptor in conjunction with um, various importance into the nucleus. And then it can be retained in the nucleus by interactions with co-repressor proteins, such as NCOR1 or NCOR2. Um, and then in the presence of thyroid hormone, we may have um, nuclear retention maintained by interactions with coactivators, such as mediator subunit one, um, also some of the lysine acetyltransferases, at which point thyroid hormone receptor becomes acetylated itself. But in this state, it's more likely to exit the nucleus in association with different exporters. Um, we don't know where deacetylation occurs, and this is something that we're working on, and also which of the deacetylases, such as the sirtuins or the CADAX, are involved. TR might go out in an acetylated form, or it might become deacetylated, but it may become deacetylated in the cytoplasm by some of the sirtuins or CADAX there, um, and then released from the exporting. It might go to the proteasome for degradation, or it might be recycled with importance and go back into the nucleus. So this is a very complicated model of the very complicated journey of thyroid hormone receptor. So I want to give a few more final thoughts on belonging in science, because for me, the science, of course, there's the, the thrill and the joy of discovery. And I love to share this with um, students and colleagues who also have that same passion. So what I find is that our diversity really enriches us and it also stretches us in many ways. We grow together, we're stronger, we're more creative together, we do better science together, and we solve problems from very diverse perspectives together. We have lots of conversations together. But there's some conversations that no one should need to have and that we do have to have them. I have had to say to some of my aspiring black students in my lab, to be validated as scientists, to have your voice heard, to be perceived as an intellectual equal, you will have to work at least twice as hard as your white peers. Or at another time, there's no room for mistakes in the lab or out on the street. Those are really unfair. And they're awful statements to have to make and they're hard conversations, but it's a reality that our nation has propagated. And it really is exhausting to live each day with, with fear and divisiveness and incivility. So what do we do? Do we stop? No, we, we persist and we can only move forward, I think, with hope. That's the way that I have to live because I, I can't live every day with exhaustion. So we need to keep listening and talking. And if we sit down together and keep talking, I think that progress can be made. And within our own labs, if we can have each other's backs and if we can help each other to navigate that daily obstacle course, if we do that together as a community of scientists, I think that we can make progress. 
So when I finish a class, teaching a class such as molecular genetics or intro bio, I always like to end with the poem Human Family by Maya Angelou. And I thought I would like to read it to you today as well, because I think it really sums up what I'm trying to say with this talk, although it's not about thyroid hormone receptor. So the human family. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious. Some thrive on comedy. Some declare their lives are lived as true profundity. And others claim they really live the real reality. The variety of our skin tones can confuse, bemuse, delight, brown and pink, and beige and purple, tan, blue and white. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane, but I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mere twins are different, although their features jive, and lovers think quite different thoughts while lying side by side. We love and lose in China. We weep on England's moors and laugh and moan in Guinea and thrive on Spanish shores. We seek success in Finland, are born and die in Maine. In minor ways, we differ. In major, we're the same. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. Thank you.